So uh, let's let's kick things off. Um, I've got a few questions here myself, and if you, if anyone in the audience has a question, uh, actually, let's kick things off with you, sir. Yeah. Of all of the many things that interest you and that you might work on, what is the thing that you think has the most potential, even if it's not the closest? But what would you be most excited to develop? Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, we published uh, a few papers over the last years suggesting that uh, almost no drug that is acting against hallmarks of aging would not increase human maximum lifespan. Uh, aging in humans and in mice is very much different. Humans do have maximum lifespan, which is without interventions, is at about 120 years old. It's a totally dysfunctional state. So we need, uh, we, well, we are 100% focused ourselves to deliver drugs that would affect maximum human lifespan. Uh, none of such drugs have been tested in humans so far, so it's a bit earlier to say uh, what precisely would work. But I think this is, let's say, this is the holy grail of what we want uh, to achieve, to double maximum human lifespan. Is there a particular yeah. Yes. yes, of course. Um, well, I, still, since nothing is, is, is tested in humans, it's, it's hard to do very specific statements. Uh, but we do see differences between uh, mammals uh, that uh, age at a different rate. And in almost all such examples, we are talking not about levels of certain things, like, like people like IL-6, your familiar target against aging. We're looking at factors that are controlling noise in biological networks, because we believe this is what is killing long-lived species like we are. So we do have drugs already, these are known drugs, uh, that we use experimentally to control the noise. And by the way, they extend lifespan in some small species twice. <laughs> Uh, but of course, this doesn't uh, doesn't uh, matter anything for humans. But at least, I say theoretically, these are the same drugs that could be applied in humans later. So we're working with the best minds in academia, and I hope that maybe next year. I mean, we published Nature Communications. We got to Scientific American uh, with let's say prophetic stuff, and we're now working in the labs to actually make it uh, work. Uh, no, in real wet laboratory. So. Uh, I will give you just one hint uh, about this, okay? So no, no specific statements, but a hint. So the hint is that uh, if you take out smoking, which is definitely bad, three years of life, <laughs> if you take out diets, uh, the strongest factor that affects uh, lifespan in humans in civilized countries is mental health or social status. So there are drugs that uh, are not your uh, familiar aging drugs that affect mental health and that uh, do extend lifespan in model organisms, and we believe that some of those mechanisms could be related uh, in a strong way. The difference between uh, top uh, quantile and the down quantile in uh, social status is almost 10 years. It's more than smoking. Of course, it's not the amount of money in your bank. It's something else. It's kind of self-perceived you know, <laughs> uh, value of quality of life. Uh, we know that in social mammals, uh, there is a huge difference in uh, lifespan between uh, breeders and non-breeders. So the social status uh, differentiates lifespan. So while everyone else is doing caloric restriction mimetics, we are doing social status mimetics, <laughs> if, this, <laughs> if this helps. <laughs> So on Jiro.ai, your website, um, I see that it was announced that a, a research collaboration with Pfizer uh, was announced to discover potential targets for fibrotic diseases. Um, so having been in Big Pharma myself for five years, I'm very interested how you navigated those conversations. All right. So <laughs> it, it, it took lots of uh, sweat and tears and two years. Uh, but finally, we've got oh, just it. Just two years? Yes, just two years. Just and two. Uh, just in two years, we've got them understand what we do. That's then one it. mortality rate doubling time. <laughs> Much less. Okay, so. Yeah. But basically, we were able to show them that we can provide a value beyond aging itself, that if we separate effects of aging from effects of diseases, then we can help them develop drugs against diseases for people of any age, okay. surprisingly, yeah. which is what they want. Hmm. And we then can keep the aging phenotype, which they do not ever want, to our in-house program. Yeah, I would Peter? possibly add that uh, you come to a pharma company and tell them, look, we're well, longevity biotech. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> 
we are telling you that aging and diseases are different and aging affects diseases and they are instantly interested because normally bi longevity biotechs are coming to them and telling that we have a pill that cures all diseases because aging is the root cause of all the, the diseases. So I think we build some credibility to them by saying that aging and diseases are different. So that got that, them interested and then they realize that if aging and diseases are indeed uh, different and we see that, then we can regress out aging from their health data to make sure, as Alex said, that in and for the God's sake, they would never develop a drug against aging because that's not something that they want. So essentially, we help them guarantee that they are not developing a drug because, for example, fibrosis and other diseases are related to aging. So it's very easy to aim at fibrosis and end up developing a drug against aging, as we know. So by uh, regressing out aging from the data, we help them to ensure that this will never happen. And that got them interested. Yeah, and also I would add here that we provide a really interesting and interpretable uh, machine learning framework to explore human data in a very new way so we can discover actually targets in walking humans using this like virtual clinical trials approach which of course caught their attention because they generate large amounts of data and they are lost in the amounts of the data and they do, like they have many great ways to work with that data but we just proposed very fresh perspective on the target discovery. I do know that the data piece is critical. So uh, what, I mean, in the last panel, we talked about um, collaborating with Big Pharma, right? And that's still a very untrodden path, I think, in the longevity field. What advice would you give to other companies um, uh, in longevity who are looking to collaborate with Big Pharma? Follow the science, be persistent. If you've done something that worked, they will see it. Okay. Any, anything from yeah, you, I, I would also add uh, that our first proposal to them was totally different from what actually worked out. <laughs> so we are delighted to say that these people took uh, their time to actually figure out how to use what we have. So I think it's a good idea to go and talk to them. Mm -hmm. They are very smart. They understand about aging a lot. Uh, they have a different perspective on aging, which is totally kind of not orthogonal, but uh, weakly overlapping to what we're having. Uh, within our bubble, I would say. So it's, it's very interesting. And, uh, well, they have lots of resources. They uh, don't want to be disrupted. <laughs> uh, they are scared by AI, so they are talking to AI companies. So I think it's a good idea to go talk to them and uh, learn from them what they actually need to do. Okay, and I'm sure you, do, you did a wonderful job building the relationships. Uh, and I'm sure Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, all these big pharma companies are very matricized. So I'm sure you have had to navigate sort of, you know, the, polit the political environment in those um, conversations. Um, so, yeah, th this yeah, one, yeah, this one is actually very easy. You just should be always on time and polite. <laughs> That's huh. it. I'm well dressed. You it's would, not that hard. You would think that the bar would be higher. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I just, it came naturally. I mean, it's, it's uh, if, if you're just, on time and polite, I think that that is solved. Of course, you should be persuasive. <laughs> but they're good scientists, and uh, they're very good scientists. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, the claim is that you've established uh, the relationship between aging and disease. Um, how yeah. does this help, and why is this interesting to pharma like companies well, like uh, Pfizer? As Alex said, uh, take any age-related problem. Well, no age is the strongest risk factor of any disease. But uh, practically, pharma doesn't care what was the risk before you got the disease. So they're only interested in the fact that you have the disease. Mm -hmm. But now, once you have a disease, uh, the aging itself, most of the time, is not the biggest problem. So for example, if a person has a stroke, I mean, age is a problem, but aging is not a problem anymore. I mean, the person would die definitely well before the effects of aging <laughs> would show up, right? So uh, what uh, medics and pharma are interested is to get something that doesn't work because you stop aging process in the time while you are recovering from stroke. They're interested to find something that is uh, helping you to recover from stroke on top of aging, irrespective of your age. Mm -hmm. So that's what in plain terms means regress out aging. They want to find factors that affect disease phenotypes no matter how old you are, as strong as possible. And since everything depends on age, all, uh, I'll say all risk factors of diseases cross correlate to each other, right? So you are always in the mess. Like you try to do a target ID against uh, chronic kidney disease and you end up with genetic factors that are risk factors of diabetes. 
And this cannot be true because there is a kidney and there is diabetes. You don't want to go to a patient and say, okay, cure your diabetes first and then we will help you with this drug. This will never work. So they are looking for, for, for creative ways how to take out this common factor that is aging and see in a very clean way what are the factors that are controlling individual diseases. Does anybody want to hop on with a question to that? Arkady? Okay. I have a couple questions here. Um, so, given the importance uh, that you assign to uh, long-lived species, um, have you ever worked with the data from long-lived species? And if yes, uh, do you have any insights to, to tell us? Well, the only uh, few bits of information about long-lived species were provided by Vadim Gladyshev uh, on Naked Mole Rats uh, once. Uh, when we worked with uh, Dmitry Podolsky, uh, who is the ex uh, Vadim Gladyshev uh, uh, gr group member. Uh, yes, uh, for us that was uh, the first evidence uh, from the data that naked uh, mole rats, that was the data from the naked mole rats, have a different, out well, I mean, uh, different physical properties that uh, got into the basis of our model. It was not much data, but it was very interesting. <clears throat> yeah, I have a, a quick question about the application of the denoising uh, treatments that you guys are interested in developing. So you've done a lot of wonderful work, sh sh you know, distinguishing between the damage and this generation of noise. Uh, so if you, let's say we had a wonderful denoising agent, um, you know, you're not gonna, ideally you'd start it as early as possible in humans, but no one's gonna let you, you give it to babies. So when would you start this treatment and how long would you have to take this to see a like, clinically meaningful okay. change? Well, first of all, um, it appears, I mean, this has to be proven, and when it will be published, we will be saying for sure. I mean, if it's something published, it's still not for sure, but at least 30 percent probability of being correct. Uh, so what appears to be true is that there are diseases that are associated with accelerated aging uh, that are also associated with excessive uh, variability in biological signals. We definitely know that certain drugs that extend lifespan in small animals uh, change the variability in uh, biological signals. So it's a job for us uh, for the coming I don't know, months and years to make sure that these kind of drugs that we know that affect noise in biological systems would also work in models of those diseases. If this is true, then it's kind of easy part in quotes. So you go to a rare disease. In a rare disease, you are even allowed to do a genetic therapy. I mean, it's financially plausible to do a genetic therapy in a rare disease. And then if uh, some of your customers do genetic disease for fun, or genetic treatment for fun, you wouldn't mind. What I'm saying is that this could be introduced to the market as a genetic therapy, maybe. And uh, if, you know, the, the benefits, uh, if it would benefit people with this, let's say, noise problem uh, medically, uh, I think it would be a way to fund uh, a trial uh, with uh, reasonably healthy individuals. Yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering about the jump from the rare disease to, you know, normal, yeah. healthy humans. Yeah. At least our feeling on that is that near Brazil is paving that way, so we kind of have an indication how much money do we need to run a trial that would be recognized with FDA as a kind of prophylaxis trial. Phase two. And we believe that a true anti-aging drug could be only prophylaxis drug, so this is why we need to accumulate those resources, and this is why we work with those pharma companies, so we can eventually do a $50 million clinical trial on a, on a maximum and a health span and lifespan in humans. Yeah, and what age would you start that? Like, is there too late an age where there's already too much yes. loss of information? Yes. So as soon as uh, chronic diseases start killing you faster, I mean, at the day of stroke, it's definitely late, right? So as soon as, soon as you age late, the diseases start killing you faster than you age, of course, this wouldn't make any sense. Um, to, 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 to the question, uh, I, I like this uh, TAME trial design, and I, I like the idea of TAME trial design. So essentially what Nero Barzilla and others are telling us they tell us that, uh, guys, pick up any problem that you want. Do phase two. Uh, show that there is a good data in phase two. And then if there is a good data in phase two, if you have money, I mean, if you have money, you can go to FDA and fund your phase three against aging. Yeah, I have a question, scientific question, if I may. Uh, so uh, there is a discussion uh, at this conference that there is a kind of universal laws of aging across mammals. Uh, we've done a little bit of work, but most informative is like Steve's presentation today on 
on aging, methylation aging in, in, in across mammals. But then you present the data that still humans and mice, they age differently. Therefore, interventions might be also different. Could you comment on that and maybe try to reconcile? Yeah. Um, are they, uh, well, we look at the same thing and uh, see different things. So how, how this uh, can happen. So I think the difference is because most of the results that are presented for this kind of universal uh, loss of aging uh, for mammals are coming from what is called supervised models. So you have the data and you train for chronological age, risk of death, so you try to predict the property. And uh, the way we analyze the data, we do unsupervised modeling. So we're looking for clusters of features that work together and can have any trajectories, not necessarily linear traje trajectory with age. So with the approach that we have, we interrogate the data and ask the data how many different age-related features are there. So if you ask the question this way, without asking what is the functional form of the age dependence, you just ask how many different classes of age dependencies are there. If you ask uh, this question to the data from mice, from worms, from flies, or to humans, to dogs, by the way, you would find that human and dogs are similar and dissimilar to mice and uh, worms and flies. And as soon as you realize that, then you start modeling. So let's say, let's say the short answer to your question that if you don't force uh, your hypothesis on the data, the data would tell you that there are more clusters of features with different trajectories in dogs and humans than in mice and worms. And then if you go deeper, you start uh, seeing more differences. And as usual, I'm super happy to discuss this in uh, you know, very deep terms. So um, we are about time. This was a bit of a lightning AMA. So thank you so much, Peter and Alex, for your time and for answering these, these awesome questions. And thank you to the, to the uh, audience as well for providing them. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Of course. Of course.